An uncle's gift of a computer changed our next guest's life. He became a sought-after computer expert while still in high school. When his Fraser Valley School banned pagers, he was exempted. One of his clients was the school's principal. <laughs> he was drawn down to Silicon Valley, and after experiencing success, he returned home, where he now helps arts and culture groups develop their identity through Skyrocket Digital. But he had his own search for identity, which led him to Angra, a dance from his family's traditional culture. His search has helped others embrace their own roots, and all of us are richer for it. Please welcome Mo Dhaliwal and friends. A big part of my job is about listening. And I was asked to come in and speak today about how Bangada can make you a better Canadian. Um, but I think it's important to frame at the outset that Bangada, this music and dance, actually just made me a better listener. And I'm gonna explain why. So for those of you that don't know, let's cover off the basics. Uh, Bangada is a uh, type of music and dance. It hails from the Punjab region that lies between India and Pakistan. And I grew up listening to the music. And you're gonna see a version, a very Canadian flavor of this performance later. Uh, but let's get into what brought me here. Uh, because like Sam mentioned, uh, Bangada for me was um, how I began my own exploration of identity. So behold, the manifestation of all my insecurities. Uh, for those of you that haven't figured it out, uh, that was me just over 10 years ago. And look at this ball of confusion. Uh, what was this guy looking for? Who told him that hairdo was a good idea? <laughs> this is a guy who started life in an entirely white neighborhood, uh, getting called Hindu and Paki. This guy uh, was also called whitewashed when he moved to an entirely Indian neighborhood. Uh, this was a straight-A student. This guy got expelled in the, gra in the eighth grade. Uh, this guy was a software developer. This guy started his career in Silicon Valley uh, by bribing a customs official to snap his papers at the border crossing outside of White Rock. But that's a whole different story. So it was actually when I moved back here from Silicon Valley that my journey with Bangada began. It was when I moved back to Vancouver and experienced the bento box of Canadian multiculturalism. Now, I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me before, uh, but I noticed how neatly organized our region is upon cultural lines. Everything seemed so neat and tidy, so careful, so specific. I was defined by terms such as East Indian, Indian, Indo-Canadian, or South Asian. Never just Canadian. Canadian meant white. And this was our cultural mosaic. So I found it really limiting as well that a rich and intriguing story about Punjabis in this territory over a century of contribution to the Canadian experiment had been reduced down to a simple definition. Brown people are from Surrey. And, and therefore, the social issues afflicting this geography were therefore brown people issues, South Asian issues. So I really learned through doing. Um, so over the next few years, um, you know, I really started in on a journey uh, about myself and about community politics um, and, and identity politics. And this personal journey actually played out in a very public space through the creation of Vancouver's City of Bangada Festival. And for a time, I was contributing to culture in Vancouver through a variety of different boards and arts institutions. I considered myself a real champion for multiculturalism and eventually became chair of the province's council, advising and reporting to the Minister of State for Multiculturalism. But throughout all this, the feelings of not belonging um, that I felt when growing up were still persisting. And I couldn't find a place for myself uh, under any label. So the only thing that I could do was smash up this mosaic and create spaces that were messy and complicated. I felt there was more opportunity for others like me to find a sense of belonging in a space that was complex and intricate. You feel really limited when everything is so neatly labeled. When things are messy and fluid though, uh, and when they're complex, you're far better able to find where you belong. So I came to realize that it wasn't the labels that were the issue. It was the assignment of a single label to a single person or community when you know that each person is a world of experiences and potentially infinite attributes to describe their many facets. So if you're gonna use labels, then use thousands. 
So I wanted to blow this all up through Pangada. And engaging with Pangada was a bit of a leap for me because I didn't come from a performance background. Uh, but it was familiar and accessible. And more than that, it was the excuse that Pangada gave us to sort of weave ourselves in and out of the many groups in this region. It was the opportunity through the festival to sort of insinuate ourselves onto the city. And that's when my perception and context started to expand. So can Pangada make you a better Canadian? Well, maybe. Uh, but not because there's something inherent with the music and dance. Uh, of course it's attractive. It's the act of engaging with something, though, that lies beyond uh, our normative notions of culture. You know, we're stuck at conversations of music and clothing and food when we need to go so much further than that before we can come to grasp the differing worldviews that are all around us and come to embrace people that might have an entirely different value system than us. For those of you familiar with this image, you'll recognize it as the one made famous by the Carl Sagan quote when he references all of human history being played out in that little tiny dust mote suspended in the sunbeam. So there's a Punjabi idiom to describe this as well. The notion of char din da mela, that our whole existence is nothing more than this sort of festival that lasts for four days. This idiom came from a culture that realized how short and fleeting all of existence is and that you have to live in the present and make the most of the life that you have. So why is any of this important? Empathy is the only reason. Human beings are weird animals. And as animals, we do some really crazy shit out of fear. But the only emotion more powerful than love, unfortunately, is fear. So empathy leads to understanding, connectedness, and belonging. Empathy defeats fear. Empathy fosters love. So that's why today, I actually no longer believe in multiculturalism and all of this language that we've created to explain the mosaic of Canada. Multiculturalism was the artifact of a society that had evolved just enough, uh, just enough empathy and understanding to believe that different peoples uh, needed to tolerate each other. Our next evolution really lies in diversity and inclusion, of creating a framework for our society where we understand that the reason to explore culture and identity is to expand our hearts and minds, to achieve radical levels of empathy that we aren't even capable of today. Diversity and inclusion isn't just about skin color, language, or religion. It's about people who are differently abled. It's about people who fall outside of our gender binaries. It's about people who represent the entire breadth of human existence and finding a place for them and giving them a voice in the wider conversation. So this isn't going to be solved by indoctrinating everyone into one way of being. I, I hear these as solutions sometimes. It won't be solved through unfettered interracial coupling leading to a planet filled with a base race of future humans. Um, <laughs> as fun as that would be. Uh, and it won't be solved by trying to eliminate difference. Differences are always going to exist. So we solve this by developing a radical empathy to bridge the gaps. So what will radical empathy do for our community? Well, suddenly, you'll find yourself noticing the structural discrimination and oppression faced by our First Nations. You'll see that denying refugees the opportunity for a better life today is as present a moment as the de uh, denial of the Komagara Maru was in 1914. And you'll see that when a national magazine decides that uh, part of the national discourse should be discussing around whether a certain university is too Asian, you'll see that for what it is, a promotion of xenophobia. You'll find yourself noticing injustice all around you. You'll be speaking up for the marginalized. You'll be acting for the benefit of those who at one point you may have thought had nothing to do with you. So it's about getting really comfortable with the fact that we live in an inherently racist power structure. All of society is engineered to cater to whiteness, shaping all aspects of our lives and our institutions. So empathy means giving up some power and perhaps leveraging your privilege to ensure that we live in a just society where people are included and all voices are heard. And isn't that what this little dot needs? More people having the opportunity to express themselves more completely and feel included in the big conversation, that big conversation about who we are and what we want for a collective future. And that's so much more important than passively consuming some other cultures, music and dance. And now, for some music and dance. <laughs> 